Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are here with Shelby today from the US. Yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be talking about a book Shelby's done uh, about her sister called Brianna. And the book is called Brave Brianna. Um, uh, so, Shelby, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. I'm just realizing I have a book next to me, so I'm putting it next a little bit closer. I have a book too. <laughs> the Brave Brianna book. Oh, you have it too. Yay. <laughs> My um, yeah, no, I'm excited. I need to get some more for some physical <laughs> in-person events, which is very exciting. Um, but I am 24. I born and raised in Michigan in the U S and Huntington's came into my life about six years ago. Um, it was known about in my family, but I never knew anything about it. It was kind of brushed under the rug and um, kept a secret just because at that point in time, there was no official diagnosis. So no one really thought anything of it. And then um, when my grandfather started getting symptomatic and went in to get tested, that's when I found out that our family had it. Um, and it wasn't until obviously my sister being diagnosed or prior to her diagnosis, just her being ill and us not knowing what it was. Um, that's the reason my father then decided to go in and get the test. He was very stubborn initially, which I understand. I mean, you don't really want to go in and get a very terrible diagnosis. Um, but once he was diagnosed, they were able to properly diagnose my sister, Brianna, who the book is about with juvenile Huntington's. And we probably went through like half a dozen diagnoses that were incorrect leading up to her JHD diagnosis. And, um, so it was bittersweet because we had clarity in that moment, knowing why she was doing the things she was doing, but also a sense of despair just because you know that Huntington's is already rare enough and that's new to our family. And then we get juvenile Huntington's, which is more rare. And now we're trying to process that. Um, so from the time that she was 11 and got diagnosed, until um, she was 14. That was the time period that we had with her after her diagnosis. And uh, from the time that she was 11, a year later after her diagnosis, she had already lost her ability to walk, talk, and eat. Um, so as, as you know, juvenile Huntington's is much more uh, rapid and progressive than the adult version even is. And it's really hard to witness, especially when doctors aren't able to give you any help. Obviously, they can keep her comfortable, but there's no cure. But that's what hopefully a lot of different organizations that are fighting together, we can hopefully get a cure in the near future. I'm praying every day. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm joining you on that. Um, so we were just talking before a little bit about Brianna, and I, I didn't really realize uh, that that you had a sister with juvenile, uh, which is what the book's all about. But mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about Brianna and what she was like? Um, and just, yeah, a bit of stories about Brianna would be nice. Oh, my gosh. Um, Brianna, when she was first born, it was actually very funny because, well, it's funny. We, looking back, we would make jokes about this when we were all with her in the last days that we had her. Because in those moments, you really have to do anything to keep yourself sane and smile. Um, but when she was young, she had some outbursts where she couldn't control her um, her emotions, kind of, you know, like I was saying with my, my dad. And we now know that that was most likely because of her juvenile Huntington's progressing before we ever had a diagnosis or really knew what was going on. But um, there were some situations where it was... it. <laughs> Made for funny memories. Um, so she she was always just very um, fierce and sassy, and uh, knew that what she knew what she loved and what she wanted to do with her time while she was here. So she was always dancing and singing. Um, my one of my sisters and I, Delaney, we sing all the time, and so she likes to sing like we did. Um, she'd sing at her talent shows and in her school choir, and she loved sports, and she did a lot of sports all the way up until she got to the point where she was no longer able to with her progression, but she was in Girls on the Run, and she did swimming. She was a cheerleader. She would do absolutely anything that she could get her hands on. Um, she loved playing with her friends and playing Barbie dolls. She had a big sweet tooth all the way up until the end, like um, until she got to the point where she was the last week unconscious, um, the week before she would still have dessert 
all lined up on her table. Um, <laughs> she had a specific no. chair in the house and she would just, and she, with her JHD, she had this OCD tendency. So she had to have like 12 different plates of cake or ice cream or whatever she wanted that week all there at, at, at once. And if you moved once, she'd get mad even if she wasn't eating it. Um, so she always had a sense of humor. And <laughs> I love that because sometimes people say that their loved ones towards the end get more of the dementia and the amnesia and they don't remember anyone. And, you know, thank the Lord. We never had that with Brianna. She knew who we were all the way up until that last moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's something I'm really, really blessed for. I think I always find that, I don't know why this is, but I always find that children who have juvenile Huntington's disease just seem to take it really well and just seem to, they live their life so, so beautifully, you know? Um, Yeah. And it always just takes me, it, it makes me quite emotional just seeing how these, these people are, these children are, and they just kind of, they enjoy themselves. And, and it's really, it's really quite courageous and inspiring. I've noticed that with children a lot. Um, before Brie had juvenile Huntington's, um, my stepsister, who is also Brie's sist- half-sister, it's so confusing, but um, my stepsister <laughs> Kylie is a two-time cancer survivor as a child. And um, so she went to St. Jude Research Hospital. And when we were there staying with her every now and then, I couldn't, I could only miss school so many days while she was there. But when we'd visit her, I was just amazed by, and I was a kid at that time, I was like nine, but all of the younger kids who had cancer and didn't necessarily know if they were going to be terminal or not, they were still so optimistic, so happy. They were just so grateful for every single day. And so I noticed that early on when I was there. And then with juvenile Huntington's, especially Brie was that way. Mm-hmm. I know some other JHD families and children. And every time I interact with them, they're just so bubbly. They're so happy. And, you know, I've met some who actually remind me a lot of Brianna. And so it's almost a blessing that through having a friendship with them, I can almost see like my sister and them. And it's, it's really beautiful, even though it is a very tragic situation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think these children must, uh, must just be, be built differently to everyone else. When you get older, <laughs> I guess we, we just kind of change or something, <laughs> deal with things differently, but yeah, we want to be children for, for lives. I think. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> we need that form of, childhood innocence to help us get through some of life. <laughs> uh, so why did you decide to do the book then? What was the idea behind that? Oh, the book idea came to fruition back at the beginning of 2021. And I, funnily enough, had um, told my mom when I was very young that I wanted to be an author. And this was before I ever had any aspiration for, to do music. I just loved poetry. I loved writing. I loved storytelling. So I would write short stories and I would write poems. And I had a poem that was published in a children's book and it like won an award. And so I thought I was going to be an author. And then I started writing music and playing guitar. And so I was doing creative outlets through my songwriting. And back in January, we were having a board meeting for my nonprofit champions for HD. And I've got some family on there. And, um, My mom said, I don't know if you saw in the Huntington's disease Facebook group, but someone posted that they were wondering if anyone had juvenile Huntington's disease specific children's book because someone in their family was just diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And I started to go through and I realized that I couldn't find any juvenile Huntington's disease specific books and even just Huntington's, um, you know, there's a few out there. I know that there's people that are publishing as we speak, but not nearly as much as we would like to have. I mean, if you go out and look at a certain type of cancer, like I would assume there's probably lots of books about breast cancer because there's lots of awareness. There's lots of fundraising with Huntington's. That's not necessarily the case. So we talked about it as a board and we voted on a budget to invest into the book because writing a book is not cheap. Um, And I just started dabbling into memories that I had of Brianna and trying to figure out how to cross a really fine line between telling her story to its most authentic self and also being aware that 90% of the audience that I'm catering to is children and you can't just be outright um, uh, upfront about some of the things she was going on, she was going through. So I started just writing down stories 
And the biggest uh, hurdle for me was actually finding the illustrator because I cannot draw to save my life. <laughs> I'm creative in other as aspects, but not at all with artistry in uh, that form. So I started going online. I found this woman. I sent her pictures of Brianna and explained the story I had in mind. And she just was really captivated by her story and the fact that she had passed and she was very honored. So she said, you know, I would love to take this on. And we probably went back and forth with edits for two months because I just wanted it to be as perfect as possible. And so I felt so bad, but it would come down to these little details where I'd say, you know what, that's beautiful. But Brianna actually did this this way, or she looked this way. And so she'd go back and she'd edit them. Um, so I'm very grateful for her, but yeah, I think I went through like, oh no, I don't know, a few different drafts before it finally got published in July. So it was like January till July. Um, and I had some editors go through it because I've never written children's books. So even though I thought I had a pretty good book, I needed someone to go through it and just look through it with children's eyes and tell me what they thought. So once we finally thought it was ready, we put it out in July. And I haven't checked it as of, I probably should have checked it right before I got on here. But last time I checked, we were at uh, 250 books worldwide. And Wonderful. right now it's actually in the process through the HD community, which is such a blessing. I had two different people reach out to me from two different countries. And so right now it is being uh, translated into German and Dutch. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, translation is an important factor too. Uh, really, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because that's that's about all one of the main reasons why HGR is created is because you know that educational content is all available in English and not and not in uh, your own language, so to speak, wherever you are. So, right, really, really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lot of juvenile HD around the world, you know. Um, yeah of like South America and places like this, there's, there's a huge amount of juvenile HD around there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, but yeah, I mean, you said it. So the book is is about, uh, it, it explains juvenile HD for children to learn about it. And yeah, that's really difficult. <laughs> that's really <laughs> difficult to do. Um, yeah. And I've actually, you know, uh, congratulations. I never thought of doing something like that and, and wouldn't have ever done it justice anyway because... Oh, uh, stop. <laughs> no, because I wasn't coming... I know, I, I haven't come from you and I HD, so for me... Oh, okay. You know, it would, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't have the experiences of you having with Brianna. So I think it, you did... I've told you this before. I told you uh, when I first read the book. It was really, really good job. Excellent job. Um, like... I was so surprised, and I mean that in a, in a nice way because it's <laughs> it's really difficult to to as you say to find that balance between being educational about juvenile entities and not scaring children, um, <laughs> and you did it. And you found that balance really perfectly. Um, so I can imagine that took quite a long time and a lot of effort to do that. Um, and yeah, I mean, just thinking about trying to do something like that is you know gives me a headache so uh <laughs> yeah it's, it's a really difficult project and you did it very well thank you yeah welcome <laughs> um yeah. so i mean you mentioned a bit about writing it there but um mm -hmm. so how did you find that kind of process and you know how did that kind of get going and did you kind of have some thoughts that that didn't you didn't quite go to that place uh at the end or, or what was the flow there <laughs> Yeah, so I I was trying to get just a general uh, idea for people who are reading of different juvenile Huntington's symptoms. And mm. when I say symptoms, I guess you could say possible symptoms because Huntington's and even juvenile Huntington's, while they're very similar for a lot of people, they do not always express the same way. So yeah. these were just symptoms that Bree specifically had faced that I know a lot of juvenile Huntington's patients typically do as well. Um, so, that, you know, there's a part in the book where she's getting angry and doesn't know how to control her emotions. There's a portion where she's in choir and she notices that her body is jiggling and jerking and she's laughing about it in the book because she's like, well, that's weird. Like, I didn't do that. Why am I doing that? 
Um, And so just going over these different uh, common things that juvenile Huntington's patients experience, and then the process of my stepmom, Brianna's mom, going to the doctor and trying to figure it out with her. And then once she gets the diagnosis, which I think that this is juvenile Huntington's, Huntington's or any adversity in life, I think this is a good message for even us adults. Brianna takes that diagnosis and she runs with it. She keeps on living her life. And through the book, you start to see in her pictures. And this is actually a part that I had to have edited so many times because I was really trying to explain to the illustrator how her facial features really progressed and how that would look in a, in a book. And so I had to keep getting edits done to get her face to look the way I was trying to explain it. And she finally did it in a, in a very beautiful way. Um, but Bree's continuing to live her life and you can tell while you're reading it and looking at the pictures that she's deteriorating. Um, but she keeps smiling. She keeps persevering and she did that in real life. Um, I don't ever really remember her being down about it, which is crazy to me, but in three years of her having JHD, there were times where she would have, obviously emotional breakdowns or things like that, but that was just from her not being able to control things. But I never once heard her say like, I hate this disease or I know I'm going to die because she did know. Um, My stepmom, her mom would have some talks with her where she would just say, you know, um, all of us have different times on this earth. And at some point, you know, God's going to take you home and that's going to look different for you than it is for me and for Kylie and Shelby and Lainey. And so she understood, but I never heard her complain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get hard on myself because on social media and on all the things I do for my nonprofit, I try my best to be very optimistic. Um, But there are times where I can get down on myself and think about what my life with Huntington's in the long term is going to look like because we don't have a cure right now. And to just think that my sister never complained. I never actually heard her say that out of her mouth. I, I mean, she's my champion. And so in the book, she's she's just embracing it like she did in real life. And there's this one part that is hypothetical because I wanted this one little boy who is actually narrating the book, but at the end you meet him and realize he's the narrator. He kind of embodies just in real life, everyone who knew Brie as a collective and what they see her as and what they remember her as now that she's gone. So she meets this boy on the park. He's upset. He's having a bad day. He feels like no one understands him. And Brianna walks over to him and like the uh, joyful spirit that she was, she said, you know, I'm Brie, what's wrong? I'd love to, you know, talk to you. And he doesn't really want to give her the time of day. He doesn't trust her. And then she starts telling him that, you know, she has this disease and even though she has it, she can always find a way to smile. So then this boy realizes that what he's going through, he can get through as well. And they become friends. And at the end of the book, he's reflecting on the fact that in that moment, Brianna changed his life forever and that she is his real life angel. And even though if you're a kid reading it, you think, wow, this is where the story ends. They're friends. She's an angel on earth. Mm-hmm. The last picture, which I, I, you know, cause you've read it <laughs> is you know, yes. Brie with angel wings. And that actually shows someone who's older and would understand that she's past. She's no longer here, but that was the most kid friendly way that we could find to strike a balance of if you're old enough to understand, you understand. But if you're a kid, you've just had this really uplifting book that ended on a good note. Um, So yeah, that was really hard to figure out how to do. But after I had some talking with our board and the editors I was working with, and then even the illustrator was helping me as well. Um, That was the best way we found to end the book, which I'm really proud of. I I think it was a lovely ending. Yeah. And it also shows a bit of Brianna's uh, personality, which is Mm -hmm. what you want to see as well. Uh, Yeah. So you're kind of talking about it a little bit here, but what are you hoping that your book, Brave Brianna, will achieve? I hope it raises awareness for juvenile Huntington's because I do think that they're, while, I, while Huntington's is important, juvenile Huntington's is slightly different from Huntington's in itself. And I did notice while we were trying to find different resources and um, research opportunities for Brianna, there's not as much opportunity for juvenile Huntington's right now in the HD community as there is for normal Huntington's. So I just want 
a louder voice and space for juvenile Huntington's disease patients and their family because they're just as important. Um, and then just helping people understand it because I remember when we got this diagnosis, Huntington's again, already hard enough, but juvenile Huntington's finding families and support groups. Um, HDSA did a great job of getting us in support groups, but still it was hard to find people to connect with. And so with this book, whether you're near or far, I hope that people can pick this up. And if they're going through it, they have a, they can use for reference or just anyone who wants to learn more about juvenile Huntington's or even just have a good life lesson of no matter what I'm going through, while it may be valid, I will make it through and I will find a way to continue to persevere and live my life because, you know, Brianna's story and so many other stories who are similar, it goes to show you that life is very short. We only have today. So even if it can be the worst day ever, you got to find a way to make the most of it. Very nice, Shelby. Very nice. Um, so the book is called Brave Brianna. Yes. Um, and is it available? I saw on Amazon. Is it available anywhere else? Um, as of right now, it's only available on Amazon. And that is an environmentally friendly option as well as a financially friendly option for us, <laughs> a, nonprofit, a small nonprofit. Um, Amazon allows me to just host it there without having to print them in, in bulk. And then it ships worldwide within you know a couple of days. So it's just been really easy to facilitate. Yeah, have. I knew if I had them all sitting in my office and I was the one shipping them all out, there's no way that they would make it on time and I would. Get <laughs> <laughs> but yep. So they're on Amazon and our goal is with the royalties to help juvenile Huntington's disease families. Um, we haven't decided specifically how we're going to do that yet. We talked about potentially as a board donating the royalties to a local make a wish chapter um, and do they have make a wish? Is that neat? Is that worldwide or is that just in yes. the US? I'm it familiar worldwide? with it, yes. Okay. So, yeah, make a wish. Brianna was a wish kid when she got diagnosed. She wished to go to Disney World. So, we thought if there happened to be a juvenile Huntington's uh, family in Michigan or the US that we could donate the proceeds to to fund their make a wish trip, that that would be a good option. But I have to do some digging to find a chapter and find a family, but that's what we're hoping to do. Hmm. Okay. That's really nice. That's really nice outcome there. Something yeah. positive for, for other families as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Shelby, do you have anything else you'd like to say about the book whilst we're talking about it? Uh, it's been very therapeutic. <laughs> it, yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Just letting it all go. But um, I think the coolest treasure for me is just knowing that this is something that will outlive, you know, myself and just knowing that it'll be here forever for someone to pick up a hundred years down the road. Hopefully by then we have cures, but if someone wants to know about Huntington's disease or what someone went through, they'll have these types of resources. And um, most of all, I just, I just want to thank everyone for the outpouring of love that it's received in the first you know, how many months, three, three months right now. Um, if you would have told me that we would be over 200 books worldwide and having it translated into multiple languages, I would have laughed at you back in January. So. <laughs> well, really well done, Shelby. Honestly, it's, I'm not, I'm not uh, just, uh, I'm not being fake when I'm saying it's actually a very, <laughs> very good book. It, it really is. Um, you. You've, you've genuinely, uh, done an excellent piece of work there so um, and yes as I said I think I told you before you, you can do my job uh, when I retire you can come and do my job oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be retiring soon I'm getting rich so oh yeah no <laughs> not at all oh, that not answer. the answer is no <laughs> <laughs> definitely not getting rich but yeah um, I but yeah, you've done a really good job with it, and um, oh, you've nice. definitely you've you've um, yeah you've done Brianna very proud. I'm sure of that. Thank um, you. So yeah, for everyone watching, it's Brave Brianna, and we will link to it. Uh, we'll link to it for you in in the uh, in the description there. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in or taking an order or two, yeah, do that for sure. Um, 
But yeah, really uh, fantastic to speak to you, Shelby. Um, and I hope to speak to you soon at some point. Uh, so our first conversation. So, you know, we need to have some more.